I'm Deborah Vagan, CEO and President of the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this special Giving Tuesday edition of the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence's Ask an Advocate series to talk more about the importance of flexible housing solutions for domestic violence survivors. NNEDV is grateful to PCADV for their partnership on this event and the Give for DV campaign. Thank you to our expert panelists for coming together today to share your knowledge and insights about housing solutions, solutions for domestic violence with us, and to Maria Williams from PCADV for facilitating this important conversation. NNEDV's strength is our network of the 56 state and territorial coalitions against domestic violence, who in turn represent over 2000 local programs. The coalitions are at the heart of what we do and are valuable resources for information about services, local programs, legislation, and policies to support domestic violence survivors. Give for DV, a nationwide cause-based campaign for Giving Tuesday, amplifies all of our voices. The campaign unites our collective work to raise awareness about domestic violence, increase community engagement, and raise funds for our work to support survivors as they find a path to healing and move from short-term safety to long-term security. Today's panel discussion with experts from coalitions and national partner organizations is about the importance of flexible housing solutions for survivors. This conversation is, an, is important because secure housing is so critical a need for survivors leaving an abuser. Domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness for women and children in the United States and access to safe, affordable housing options is regularly reported by survivors as the biggest barrier to building a life free from abuse. NNEDV conducts an annual domestic violence survey. This unduplicated count of adults and children seeking domestic violence services documents the number of people who sought services in a 24 hour period, as well as the types of services requested, the number of services, unfortunately, uh, the requests that went unmet, due to a lack of resources and issues and barriers that domestic violence programs face as they try to provide services for, for victims and their children. Our 15th annual Domestic Violence Counts report revealed that on September 10th, 2020, the day of our count in 2020, over 38,000 victims of domestic violence found refuge in emergency shelters, transitional housing, or other housing provided by local programs. On the same day, however, over 6,300 requests for shelter and housing weren't met because of a lack of resources. When people give for DV today or any day of the year, they're making a difference in our collective work to provide survivors and their families the support they need to live in security and safety, including making sure safe and secure housing options are available for every survivor seeking help. You can donate or read more about the campaign by going to givefordv.nnedv.org. And please also check out the websites of all of our other participating organizations today, which I will believe will be dropped into the chat during the event. So now it's my pleasure to turn the conversation over to Maria, the Director of Housing at, at PCADV, who's facilitating today's panel of incredible speakers. Thank you. Maria? Thanks so much, Deborah, and it's wonderful to have you all here with us. We so appreciate your time today. Um, I'm going to go around and introduce our panel of speakers who are colleagues and friends of mine from across the United States. And again, we're so grateful for everyone taking the time. Um, so with us today is Linda Olson from the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Brittany Eltringham from the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, Debbie Fox from the National Network to End Domestic Violence, Grace Swan from the API Center on Gender-Based Violence, Sierra Hart from the New Jersey Coalition Ending Domestic Violence, Gwen Packard from the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, Maylene Krantz from Transitions of PA, which is a PCADV member program, Vashti Bledsoe from the Lutheran Settlement House, which is also a PCADV member program, and then in closing, we'll hear from Susan Higginbotham, who is the CEO of PCADB. So first we'll go to Linda Olson. Um, Linda, 
Can you tell us a little bit about how Washington State became a leader in DV Housing First work and focus on flexible funds and how this became um, a leading solution for survivors? Okay, Maria, and thanks everybody. It's an honor to be here and sorry, my computer had a meltdown. So my camera is not on, but I'm definitely here. So in terms of how Wiskative became a leader, it initiated with the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, some 12 years ago, approaching Wiskative to see if we would test pilot um, the possibility of domestic violence housing first. And, and see if a housing first approach would work for survivors. Um, in the process of doing that, we gathered together, we certainly talked with the agencies that had been identified. There were 13 at the very beginning and the, the pilot started with four, growing to 13. And um, we, we definitely looked at survivor-driven trauma-informed mobile advocacy, um, community-based, um, tailored for the community, whether that was a, an urban or a rural community, whether that was culturally specific, tribal. And um, those were the things that we identified. And we also went in with the Gates Foundation and their firm commitment that no matter what anybody did in terms of their service side of the package was flexible financial assistance absolutely had to be a part of it and survivor driven so that survivors of domestic violence would identify what was it that would be the most helpful for them as they um, you know, I identified housing, stabilized in housing. Um, and, and of course we started pretty much with the, the broad open sort of, it had to be housing related. And um, uh, as Maria would know from LifeWire while she was there, there was this, um, a little pushback of, well, survivors should be able to do anything. And uh, with, with that um, and the conversations with the Gates Foundation, we all fell in line with the idea that it didn't have to be directly housing related. That flexible financial assistance should be what a survivor identified as, as bringing health, hope, well-being. It might be access to employment funds, um, it could be transportation. Yes, we purchased some cars along the way. And Maria, if you want to interrupt me, if I'm just going off on a mad trot and I'm, I'm missing the target, please let me know. But um, unless I hear otherwise, I'm going to keep right on going with um, just all of the innovative things that survivors identified. This, this is important. Um, one of the things that That's many- important point, Linda, that the, the funding was really able to be responsive. Um, right. So I really appreciate um, what you're sharing. Okay. And, and just again, in that responsiveness and the wide open sort of what is it that survivors needed to make their home safe, maybe it was security, to make it warm and welcoming and uh, include the well-being and health of every family member, um, children were important. And this perhaps early on was a little bit of um, a challenge for some funders, certainly not the Gates Foundation to my delight, but we, we found that um, programs were using money to help kids with different needs that they might have and, and beyond clothing, but the sorts of things that were fees for school, athletic fees, birthday parties. Um, there's a fish tank in there somewhere. There, there were things that normalizes the lives for kids. And so with that move and the fact that when a parent knew that their kids were doing well and thriving, when, when they were able to uh, perhaps purchase things that would make a difference, um, as we saw and heard from many survivors, that was the confidence they needed. Their kids were happy and they could go, they could work, they could feel like um, there was a future. So it was a full package and flexible financial assistance made the difference with that. Um, as we moved beyond that pilot, it was successful. There was a reinvestment in terms of uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation money so that um, 
we were able to do a demonstration project, demonstration and research. Uh, they funded part of the research and then they also received Health and Human Services Foundation funding for more of the research. Um, and that was basically looking at a longitudinal study that uh, is just wrapping up. It's conducted by Drs. Chris Sullivan and Gabriela lopez Aron from Michigan State University. And um, you'll hear more about that. But what we continue to see, even with our first evaluation and now the second one, longitudinal study, is that this approach, emphasis on flexible financial assistance and the flexibility of advocacy, makes a huge difference in the lives of survivors. Um, what we've been able to do with that also is to uh, solicit money from other sources. So um, one that I just wanna mention, Colwell Banker Bain, a real estate um, firm was able to donate about $105,000 and invested it in what they called through us, the Bring Hope Home project. And the idea again was flexible financial assistance for survivors so that they could access the housing that was the best for them and um, use flex money in a way that was the most logical for them. That's really great information, Linda. I think um, one of the things that folks are often curious about is, you know, the Gates Foundation made that initial investment. That's so great to hear about Caldwell Banker. Um, but how were other funders brought to the table, um, given that this was um, a, a new and innovative and still is a method of spending funds? There were regular conversations with funders all the way through from our local folks at, um, at the VOCA office, OCVA, to our um, funders at the different local communities, um, City of Seattle, King County. One of the things that the Gates Foundation was always very diligent about when we had our cohort gatherings, which we did regularly, was funders were invited to the table. So we had funders from each of the counties that any of these organizations were located in so that they could hear the process. They could sometimes hear directly from survivors themselves who had uh, benefited and certainly hear from advocates on what a difference it made. Um, they were able to hear firsthand from the evaluators on how successful it was and just, um, you know, being able to invest in a way that didn't feel defined and sometimes punitive um, and, and that freeing opportunity. So there, there was a wonderful move in a number of funders, um, public funders that got a little more flexible, you know, not completely, they weren't out getting ready to buy cars or, or um, games for the kids, but a little more flexible in terms of the different ways the money could be used. And um, I've, I've been pleased to see that movement. Um, it's helped that the Gates Foundation did that with funders. They also did it with other philanthropic organizations. So they've convened regularly with um, Philanthropy Northwest, which is a major organization in Washington state um, of other philanthropic foundations so that they could also hear. And um, so the encouragement could be, this is a really important investment for survivors for the stability and health and long-term well-being. Thanks so much. I think that it's really incredible to think about how one funder can influence others, but I think even more importantly that survivors' stories are actually centered and how funding is developed um, based on what survivors are needing. Hearing from survivors directly as funders, hearing from advocates directly at the grassroots level um, can really make a huge difference. So thank you so much for, for sharing your insight, Linda. We appreciate it. You are so welcome. Thank you. The, the work in Washington and other states has really gained incredible attention across the country. And national partners have been engaged to support uh, the work happening at the grassroots level. One of the key partners in this work is the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence. 
And um, Brittany, if you could tell us a little bit about um, the National Resource Center engagement in DV Housing First and the promotion of flexible funding, and um, if you would be willing to talk about other partnerships, national organizations to further the work, that would be great. Hi, Maria, um, and hello, everyone. I just want to express my appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity to be here with this incredible panel of speakers and to be here with my colleague, LaVon Morris Grant, um, who is the newest um, uh, Director of Community Engagement at NRCDV. Um, and Linda, it's also a pleasure to be with you because I was an advocate um, at the local level, really soaking in the information from the Washington State Coalition and your leadership around flexible funding. Um, so thank you so much for introducing Levon. Levon, I'm so sorry I missed you in my notes, and we're so grateful you're here. Um, so, Brittany, thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, as I mentioned before coming to NRCDV, um, I worked at a local program here in the state of Maryland. I just want to mention this before I dive into the work at the National Resource Center. Um, I experienced firsthand uh, the impact of flexible financial assistance, both for survivors and as an advocate. Um, I have been the advocate uh, requesting the use of flexible funds for survivors. I have been the program manager who was empowered to make decisions about the use of those, those flexible funds. Um, but I've also been the program manager that was advocating with my executive director and advocating with the continuum of care for more flexible dollars for survivors. Um, and on a really personal note, I have been the friend and the colleague who has had to crowdfund um, and, and donate money for um, survivors um, in my community who needed assistance and couldn't access that assistance through um, social services. Um, NRCDD's mission is to strengthen and transform the efforts that um, uh, to end domestic violence. And we lead the National Capacity Building Center on safe and supportive housing for DV survivors. Um, and the goal of that capacity building center is to improve responses to survivors and their families across the continuum of publicly and privately um, funded homeless services and housing programs. Um, I think that many folks look to us as a, as a leader, um, particularly as it relates to racial equity um, and increasing, um, uh, uh, improving the response to survivors from Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, we maintain safehousingpartnerships.org, um, which I can put a link to that in the chat. Um, but maybe this is Facebook Live, so there's not actually a chat box. Um, and then a, a big focus, I think, as we um, integrate survivor justice with racial justice is looking at housing as prevention um, and building the evidence base as it relates to the impact of um, uh, a wide range of housing solutions and the opportunity for survivors to um, attain financial security. Um, at NRCDV, I respond to requests for technical assistance received through Safe Housing Partnerships. Um, and over the last year, I can tell you that there has been um, a real increase in requests directly from survivors who are looking for housing assistance, rental assistance, relocation assistance. Um, and so this is something that I'm, I'm deeply passionate about. Um, as it relates to racial equity, yes, there is the need to attend to um, the persistent racial disparities in domestic violence, housing and homelessness, as well as um, wealth and financial well-being. But I also think that a big role that we play as it relates to racial equity is, is really looking at the mechanisms by which we give help or support. Um, and I think a lot of the ways that we conceive of giving um, as it relates to service provision is more in a charity mindset and not so much in a interdependence and mutuality mindset. And so I just really wanna uplift um, the work of one of our partners, Free From, which is a sur survivor led organization dedicated to um, wealth building and financial security for survivors. And they have this really amazing report called Trust Survivors Building an Effective and Inclusive Cash Assistance Program. And something that they say in that report is that they learned from running the safety fund that a survivor-centered approach to dispersing money, one that recognizes that every survivor knows their circumstances best, is as important as the cash itself. Um, and again, as an advocate who was able to um, uh, distribute flexible funding, I can tell you that it 
it was so meaningful to actual, actually be able to say, yes, we can meet your needs. Um, when so often, you know, as Deborah shared the, the number from the census counts earlier, I was also on the receiving end of, of phone calls um, where our shelter was full or we didn't have um, the money in our budget to be able to support um, someone's needs. And it was always the most amazing feeling to be able to give folks money and ask as few questions as possible about what they needed that money for and, and to have the trust and the understanding that survivors knew their situations best um, and that they really just needed um, the money that they are, are systematically excluded from or, or um, excluded from, through, from the experience of their abuse. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of share from that perspective, I think NRCDV, um, we are, are just really humbled and honored to be able to have the position that we have, to, to, to have the leadership that we have, um, and to be able to leverage that in service of what survivors to have, tell us they need and what they've been telling us for a really long time that they need, um, which is more often than not the money um, to make choices for themselves and their families. Thank you so much, Brittany. I think that um, you brought up a really important point about looking at housing as prevention. And I think that that's something that oftentimes funders don't understand um, in the way that, that advocates like you and I would love them to. So if you could expand on that for just a minute, that would be really helpful. Oh, safe housing is foundational to everything. Um, it's it's the folks that are inside your house that create a sense of safety. It's the location of your home and the neighborhood and the community in, in, in which you're living. You know, do you feel safe walking to public transportation? Um, so we know um, that that housing is intimately connected to health. We know that it is intimately connected to children's health um, and, and, and their long-term developmental um, experiences. And, and, and um, I, I just, I struggle um, to uh, put into to talking points what, what ends up feeling so, um, plain and clear um, when you're an advocate and you see the way that it impacts folks, um, people who have to make choices to stay in unhealthy living environments if it means keeping a roof over their head or keeping a roof over their children's head. Um, and then the way that people are able to um, thrive in safe housing, but also, you know, home ownership as a mechanism of wealth building, like, uh, uh, and, and as an indigenous person, I know the impacts of, of being removed from land and not being able to um, have a home on, on your land and, and the way that that um, impact, impacts your ability to access clean water. Um, and so there's so much that is connected to having a, a safe, um, home and it, it, it touches every facet of our lives. And um, I think that once you start to understand housing as prevention, you can't, you can't unsee it. There's no way to see it any other way. Absolutely, thank you so much. I think it's this incredible intersection of what we have systematically excluded survivors from for years and years and years. Really being able to put that wealth back to them um, can prevent them from experiencing all sorts of consequences that the system that we have has set them up to experience. I think that I so appreciate your point and I really appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Debbie, we'd love to turn it over to you now from NNEDV's perspective and hear a little bit about how NND, NNEDV's engagement and role in the national work has moved um, flexible funding and DV Housing First forward. Yeah, thanks, Maria. It's super great to be with you all and with the, all these wonderful colleagues. Um, and to have this conversation today on Giving Tuesday. So yeah, a big part of our work at the National Network to End Domestic Violence is, um, is taking the information that we're hearing from the field, what we know works, and then having those conversations with federal funders, staffers, and legislators, and really telling them and telling them the impact of what's happening. So I know Linda mentioned earlier, you know, 12 plus years ago, there was the conversation around DV housing first and um, making that happen with, you know, pilot projects. And now we know that DV housing first is pretty much 
a national model. Housing First is part of the homelessness and housing system. So we're really thinking about how do we take this work to scale in terms of the flexible funding response to survivors. Um, you know, we're in the midst of the pandemic right now. Um, we know it's still happening, it's not over. And so this is a time where we have seen the effectiveness, not only within our programs of innovating, doing things differently, making programs, um, you know, more accessible, more inclusive for survivors and looking at ways that we can have money and resources directly go into the hands of those most impacted by um, the pandemic and historical racial and um, inequities around gendered violence as well. So we're thinking in terms of the work of how do we take this to sc sc scale and then continue on and and institutionalizing what we're learning and what has happened um, over the years with um, flexible funding, but also what we've learned through the pandemic. So we want things to look different and be different when we get to the other side of this. And you know, we're hopeful. There's a lot of work happening um, at, um, at with the fiscal year 2022, um, with the president's budget, the House and the Senate um, having uh, funding, direct cash assistance funding in the FIPSA Family Violence Prevention Services Act. Um, appropriations. So we're really hoping that that happens. Um, we're not there yet, maybe um, in the winter, in the new year in 2022, but there's the hope that um, the funding streams will be responsive and there'll be direct cash assistance. So really, if a survivor is coming to a program, they can, you know, make the request of what they what they need. Linda mentioned a car, like that's uh, that's phenomenal. That wouldn't have happened 20 some years ago when I was starting out in the field doing housing work. Um, that would have been unheard of, but thinking of different ways, I'm not, I don't think the federal government's gonna fund us to get cars, maybe electric cars, that's, that's a joke. But anyways, um, so uh, maybe there's, you know, possibilities for us to think expansively and to have that direct cash assistance go to survivors directly. And we're feeling very hopeful. And of course, um, the work of many people here um, on this panel have made that happen with that research and and um, and, and the funders and, and our legislators are being responsive to that need. Um, and we're hoping, you know, there's there's so much work and growth that we, we need to do, but you know, that there can be some positive things, um, how we provide services and how we, um, support those who are most impacted in our in our country by gender violence and by racism inequities um, that that can happen um, with um, our legislative efforts. Thanks, you Fox. I think that makes so much sense. And I love what you're talking about with the um, idea of funding streams actually being responsive to what survivors need. Um, and I'm wondering um, where you've seen the most success over the years, like in working in the, the federal government where you've been able to find the most support and the most movement um, to be able to, to really look at how funding streams could be different? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's definitely, there's a bunch of different strategies and ways we're looking at doing the work, but I do think having kind of a groundswell and everybody thinking and having similar um, ideas and having kind of this learning community, I know that, um, you know, there's there's always been work in terms of mutual aid and, and different communities. I know Brittany mentioned like helping out friends and and folks who who need rental rent rent money. And sometimes the systems didn't work for communities of color or, or LGBTQ or marginalized communities. But if there's ways that we can, um, you know, have these communities of learning and and really um, have this national network of um, people who are doing DV and SA related housing work, um, we really have a strong voice in terms of being clear with federal funders and, and foundations. And there's a, there's a clear ask that we, we know what works and we've seen what works and having a lot of people saying the same thing really, really helps. And um, there's a lot of DV, our state domestic violence coalitions and also some of the sexual assault coalitions are you know doing housing work. And then in turn, working with all the different local communities and working with their continuums of care. So we're seeing, a lot more being invested into housing, into domestic and sexual violence housing in particular. People are really understanding the intersection around domestic violence and sexual violence and homelessness and what kind of risk that causes for survivors, in particular survivors of color. Um, so, so we have all the information and knowledge. It's really, um, we're, we're at, a, at a critical point too, where we're seeing 
hopefully a lot more investments will will happen. Um, you know, we're hopeful with the Build Back Better agenda um, that there'll be more housing resources there as well. They're not um, all survivor specific, although there is some around um, voucher um, set asides for DBSA survivors. But we're really hopeful that the that there'll be more investments in our country for affordable housing, more housing units, um, more around home ownership, and really um, having having um, having the investments that we need um, to to make it happen. Um, you know, the legislations the legislation hasn't been passed yet, but you know, there's a real need for major investments at the federal level because um, local communities are doing great jobs. Many state um, state um, legislators and are, are doing a great job of passing different investments around housing, but there really needs to be a federal response too as well to increase housing resources and in particular affordable housing because we hear a lot from our constituents that great, we have vouchers for survivors or we have these resources or we have rapid rehousing, HUD money, but there isn't housing to get survivors placed into or to get access to. So we really need to make sure the supply is met. So there's um, an affordable housing stock for survivors. Thank you so much. I think that um, the idea of developing that housing stock specifically with survivors in mind and knowing that federal funding can be used in flexible ways is such uh, an incredible uh, piece of work that NNEDV has spearheaded and has really led to um, BIPOC and small communities actually being able to access some of the, these tools um, rather than just being dependent on um, philanthropic funding. Um, so having both, I think, has been really essential. So um, thanks so much. And with that, we'll move on to Grace. Um, Grace, confidentiality um, is a critical component of work with survivors. And in speaking about um, survivors who are in small communities, can you speak to your work with survivors and the importance of flex funds for those who are undocumented? Sure. And before I get started, I want to say thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Grace Wong. I'm the director of policy at the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a national resource center and we provide technical assistance, training, research and policy work um, focused on domestic and sexual violence and human trafficking in the Asian um, American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities across the US. Um, and uh, before I go even deeper, one of the projects that we participate in is the Alliance for Immigrant Survivors, which is a coalition of national groups focused on uh, immigration related policies. And we co-chair that along with Esperanza United, ASISTA Immigration Assistance and the Tahari Justice Center. So back to your question. Um, so confidentiality obviously is critical for survivors um, and their willingness to come forward to be able to get the help that, that they need to address domestic violence, um, to address uh, the harm they've experienced. Um, first and foremost, of course, assurances to survivors that the information that they share with advocates or others um, will be kept private is really important so that folks can feel comfortable sharing some of the most painful experiences that they've had in their lives uh, without worry that it will be disclosed to others. I mean, they need to know, survivors need to know that their information won't be, somehow get back to their abusers or, you know, their family members or friends. Um, and they need to know that it won't be shared with other systems, such as the police or the child welfare system, or sometimes their employers, for example, because confidentiality about the harm, the domestic violence they've experienced, um, uh, is important not only about that, but it's also, um, you know, other issues are important to keep um, confidential so that survivors aren't put at risk. You know, examples might be information about, you know, their general location, obviously, so their abuser can't find them, possibly. Um, information about their immigration status, um, you know, for the populations that, that we work with. Um, any health or disability issues that might impact their job or eligibility for some kind of, you know, benefits or, you know, other issues that might Im implicate child welfare involvement. Um, 
With respect to immigrant communities, um, you know, we focus a lot on immigrant communities at my organization because over two thirds um, or approximately two thirds of the Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander um, communities in the US are foreign born. Um, and you know, over the last couple of years, you know, increases in immigration enforcement has really contributed to lots of immigrant survivors being afraid to reach out for help because they worry that if they do, they worry that systems such as the police or government agencies, welfare agencies, such as those that um, provide financial or housing assistance may be sharing information with immigration officials or um, with other law enforcement entities. And you know, as we know from decades of work, um, including work on the Violence Against Women Act back in the, 1990, in the 1994 Violence Against Women Act recognized that abusers of immigrant victims, they often leverage this fear of, of you know, interaction with immigration enforcement or fear of deportation. And abusers often threaten survivors with deportation or separation, permanent separation from their children if they reach out for help or share information about the abuse. Um, a recent survey that we did in partnership with NNEDV and um, the Sexual Assault Coalition and, and um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, you know, a recent survey of advocates working with survivors um, report that three in four immigrant survivors have expressed concerns to their advocates about contacting the, the police and over half of them fear going to court um, related to the, the violence that they've experienced because of immigration enforcement. So, so you know, that is a, a huge fear that immigrant survivors uh, face. Um, in addition, immigrant survivors also face the, the challenge of really complicated um, rules relating to access to public um, benefits programs and housing programs. Uh, a lot of immigrant survivors, even ones who have status um, under the Violence Against Women Act, for example, or who have crime victim visas, or who are eligible to apply for certain victims, uh, you know, victim-related protections in the immigration law, um, a lot of them, you know, have multiple multiple year waits to get status, and um, you know, it's going to be probably at least five to ten years for them to have um, their cases approved uh, because of long backlogs, and they are often not eligible for a lot of the public housing um, benefit programs, or and they're ineligible for federal cash and food assistance. And for those folks that don't have um, access to those benefits, uh, flexible funding programs, um, flexible housing assistance and cash programs are so critical, um, especially programs where survivors feel safe um, because they don't have to disclose their social security number, they don't have to give one, they don't have to share their immigration status. And um, because of you know, the lack of other public um, and other benefits programs that they're eligible for flexible funding has been a lifeline for um, so many immigrant survivors, both including um, you know, the program that was mentioned earlier at Free From, and then um, you know, the programs that Belinda mentioned earlier um, as it relates to DV Housing First. So without, um, we you know, really encourage investment in flexible funding programs um, so that the most you know, diverse and, and underserved uh, you know, survivors that have the most barriers to access um, can get uh, access to that critical um, benefit. Thanks. Thanks so much, Grace. I really appreciate um what you said and i think that the point about um immigrant survivors needing access to this funding almost more than any other survivor um is so essential um and particularly with um the way that the pandemic has has impacted immigrant communities and the way that police violence Im uh, impacts immigrant communities making sure that we're not just relying on grassroots efforts to support immigrants and immigrants to support other immigrants but there are systems in place to make sure that folks are safe that need it the most so thank you so much i really appreciate your time mm -hmm.
Um, Sierra, we'd love to move on to you um, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I think every state through the pandemic has seen how uh, money has been invested differently. And you and I have had conversations about the differences between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, and I, I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit about how New Jersey has invested um, in survivor housing during the pandemic. Um, yes, first I want to say thank you so much for um, including me on this esteemed panel. Um, I'm so grateful for uh, the many of you that I've looked to for guidance as we help um, survivors navigate housing in New Jersey specifically. Um, so we've been fortunate in New Jersey that, of course, as many of you have said, um, housing we know is safety for survivors. We know that housing is justice for survivors. We know that housing um, without housing and, and meeting the basic needs of survivors that um, it's really hard to go on to, you know, the next step in helping a survivor um, navigate their journey towards living lives free of violence. In New Jersey, we had a few things happen during COVID. Um, so one of the things that we um, knew was that there was going to be a greater um, need for housing um, and, and food, meeting the basic need. Um, so one of the things that we were able to do, um, so I'm so grateful for the partnership with the New Jersey Division on Women, um, but we were able to create a hotel aggregator program. So um, in New Jersey, typically, um, anyone that was fleeing domestic violence would be able to access safe houses in each county. New Jersey is broken down into counties. Um, but what we knew was that there would be a greater need for um, housing. And we also wanted to adhere to COVID guidelines. Um, so we were able to pivot, um, as I always say, and um, build partnerships with hotels and motels as a another means to house families. Um, what this also did was open up options for housing for those, as many of you continue to say, um, what it looks like for those who are from marginalized communities. So. Um, even families who typically didn't feel safe maybe accessing safe housing or the traditional safe housing options could now um, stay together as a family unit um, and uh, be housed in hotel motel placements. Um, so that was helpful. But as many of you have said, also with um, the funding that we're very grateful for, uh, we were able to tap into some federal funding and some state funding, FIPSA, FEMA, VOCA, um, to be able to house survivors. Um, flexible funding is still needed because we had to, one, address food, um, even with those who are in hotel placements, as many of you have said. Also, laundry, something that wasn't considered sometimes. Transportation um, in New Jersey, uh, it looks very different in different areas. Um, so even access to being able to have uh, flexible funding for technology, access to technology, again, because we not only want to house survivors, but again, as many of you have said, sort the survivor-centered approach, meeting their other needs while they're in hotel motel placement. So we were able to do that. Um, my uh, The VOCA funding has allowed for me to be on call, or I was on call at that time, 24-7, supporting survivors and advocates and hotel um, staff that weren't uh, there, that were new to this process, I'll say. Um, but also, too, uh, the funding has really been um, helpful in being able to continue those placements. So as of right now, I'm proud to say that New Jersey still has the hotel aggregator program um, running. Um, simultaneously, we were able to use uh, VOCA funding um, it wasn't as flexible. Well, it's flexible, I'll say, but not as flexible as we know that um, unrestricted funding is for survivors. Um, so we also piloted a Housing First pilot project. Um, so that was a program to help with the many needs of survivors. So um, again, as many of you have said, not only are we trying to um, address the immediate needs of survivors, but also the goal is to help them to um, obtain safe, stable housing. Um, so the Domestic Violence Housing First Project, I do wanna say kudos to Washington State who was able to um, talk through the many things and NNEDV who was able to talk through the many things that we encountered. Um, while rolling out this project. Um, this project, we did serve anyone that wasn't able to um, tap into local resources, but we did have an influx from those from marginalized communities who were unserved or underserved. Um, and some of those things that we were able to address um, with our our pilot project, the Domestic Violence Housing First pilot project, um, which was VOCA funded, um, were things such as like transportation, because without transportation, you're not able to either, you know, go look at houses or go to work. Um, child care assistance so that people could um, continue with education or again, attend work. Um, 
So uh, there were some of the things that we were able to address, relocation assistance, um, we continue to see barriers um, with survivors being able to access relocation assistance. So um, our pilot project was able to do that. Um, and again, uh, because this was an unrestricted funding, there were still unmet needs, as many of you have said. So one of the things that I can continue to think of is food and transportation continues to be an outstanding um, need. And that's where unrestricted funding, donors, um, gift cards, anything that um, survivors can get their hands on in terms of unrestricted, um, it's helpful. Even um, laundry, honestly, there were a lot of barriers with laundry um, access and hotel motel placements. And then lastly, um, what else do we do for housing? Um, yes, we had that. We had the hotel aggregator and the um, and the, I think that's it. I feel like I'm missing something, but I do want to just say that we were able, I'm grateful that, um, we were able to emphasize the need for survivors and housing, but as many of you have said, we still have a long way to go. Thanks so much, Sierra. I think that, um, what you're talking about regarding, you know, survivors having a, you know, a roof over their head is one thing, but really it's about how do we help them be stable and, um, how wonderful it is when you can actually put money in the hands of survivors so they can do things like purchase technology for themselves so it meets the needs of their family. And they can purchase, um, you know, laundry cards so they can do their family's laundry and it's not something they continually have to come to us to ask for. So the more flexible the money, the more it can go directly to survivors, the better. So thank you so much for talking about the incredible work in New Jersey. We appreciate it. Thank you. And we're gonna pivot now to Gwen. Um, Gwen, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of um, flexible funding and meeting uh, indigenous survivor housing needs? Um, talk to us a little bit about some of the unique needs for indigenous survivors and, and particularly in rural areas. Sure, thank you. Wopida, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Uh, my name is Gwendolyn Packard. I'm a Hongdawan Dakota and a survivor of domestic violence. I work with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center that was founded in 2010. And this year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary as the National Indian Resource Center funded by FIPSA. Uh, NIWRC is dedicated to reclaiming the sovereignty and safety of native women. NIWRC works with tribal nations, Alaska native villages, native Hawaiians and Indian communities to strengthen their capacity to respond to domestic violence and enhance safety for native women and children. Our mission is to provide national leadership to end violence against native women by supporting culturally grounded grassroots advocacy. I'm sure many of you are aware of the staggering statistics we experience. As indigenous women, we live our lives in the dangerous intersection of gender and race. Native women experience the highest rates of domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, stalking, trafficking, and missing and murdered. Rates higher than any other population in this country. NIWRC works closely with tribal domestic violence programs and shelters. And the number one need we hear over and over again is the need for safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable housing. Why don't women leave or why do women stay in abusive relationships? We always hear that question. Well, one of the main reasons is they have no place to go. For the domestic or sexual assault survivor, access to safety means access to shelter and housing. We have 574 federally recognized tribes in the US and yet there are fewer than 50 tribal domestic violence shelters in the whole country. The lack of safe and affordable housing in Indian country is a reality that so many American Indians and Alaska natives face. Without adequate housing on tribal lands, victims are often forced to leave their ancestral homelands, lands of significant cultural meaning to them, leave their tribal community, their relatives, their families and uh, support systems enter non-native shelters or shelters that can address their cultural needs or understand all the trauma they've experienced, or they return to their abusers. And homicide uh, by an intimate partner is the third leading cause of death for native women. 
Domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness. It's also important to note that one of the top reasons for child removal is inadequate or overcrowded housing. When we look at poverty, uh, lack of safe, affordable housing, lack of resources to address domestic violence, lack of viable employment opportunities, you can see how all these factors work together to create a dangerous systems downward spiral that's very difficult to mitigate or come out of. For domestic uh, violence victims, survivors, we see layers and layers of vulnerability, increased risks and dangers, and new or continued uh, victimization. NIWRC wants to change this picture and um, flexible funding for tribal domestic violence and sexual assault victim survivors is critical to that. Through a joint project with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence and the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, we established a national work group on safe housing for American Indian Alaska Native survivors of gender-based violence and held several meetings and developed a report and recommendation recommendations based on those um, convenings. Many key recommendations came from this report and perhaps the most significant outcome um, is the creation or establishment of a capacity building center on safe and supportive housing for domestic violence survivors and tribal communities. In October, uh, uh, just last month, <laughs> NIWRC was notified that we were awarded the Tribal Safe Housing Center discretionary grant from the uh, Family Violence Prevention Services Administration. And we will be launching uh, this project shortly after the first of the year. And we're extremely excited to add this housing lens to the critical work that we do in tribal communities. And we look forward to working with all of you as we move forward in establishing the Safe Housing Center for Tribal Communities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gwen. That's such exciting news. And um, I think is incredibly overdue. And um, the, the work that you all do for um, Indigenous communities, I think, is unparalleled. And to be able to support it with funding from the federal government in that way is the the very least that can be done so congratulations and i think that will really um help move things along for um people of color in general and but particularly um the the folks that we work with that um, are indigenous and live on native land so thank you thank you we're now going to move to uh, mayling krantz and mayling um as the executive director of a local program, we'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, what's your experience with providing housing in your area, particularly in regard to COVID-19 and how um, are flexible funds important? Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Um, as Maria said, I'm Maylin Kranz. I'm the CEO of Transitions of PA and we're located in central Pennsylvania. We're a member program of PCADV and I'm so fortunate to be also be a board member um, of, of PCADV and also a, a board member of the um, Eastern PA Continuum of Care. Um, so heavily involved in a lot of um, housing work here in central Pennsylvania. Um, our program particularly has um, federal funding that does um, emergency safe housing, uh, rapid rehousing work, as well as permanent supportive housing. Um, I would say that one of the number one um, issues, and many of the other um, panelists have said this, um, that we experience or that we're seeing um, survivors experience around finding safe, affordable, um, sustainable housing is just the availability of units. Um, in, in rural areas, uh, particularly where we, we live, there's not um, new housing stock. The housing stock that's here has been here a long time. Um, we're not seeing new builds that provide access uh, for new housing. And uh, when new units are, per, are built, um, they're often not affordable. And so you have both availability issues, you have affordability issues. Um, we're really thankful and appreciative to have funding that's, that's able to support some of the needs for individuals who are um, survivors and, and seeking safe housing. Um, but there are often restrictions to those funds that just don't allow us to be able to access um, safe, affordable units for individuals. 
Um, oftentimes we find units that are available, we have we have to work with landlords who don't necessarily uh, want to make the changes to their units to make sure that they're meeting um, safety guidelines or codes guidelines. So there's a lot of complications that happen there. Um, being a rural community, we also have really very limited transportation. Uh, we don't have any public transportation. And so when we do find a unit that's 15, 20 minutes from uh, away from where um, you know, the hustle and bustle of everything going on is it's it's not a workable unit for a survivor. And so that um, creates some additional barriers. Co the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly um, added some additional complications and barriers to what's happening around housing for survivors. Um, we've seen a significant in, uh, increase in requests for, for help for housing. Um, initially, there things had seemed to slow down for a little bit, but then um, the calls started really flowing in more than what we were, um, what was typical for a program like ours to see. And, and so we had a lot of um, individuals who were fleeing, who needed emergency housing initially, um, with trying to put uh, safety provisions in place um, for um, group living or, or communal living in our emergency safe houses. Um, that provided some limitation to how many people we could serve in that regard. And then when we were able to house them in one of our safe houses or get them into a hotel, um, it was difficult to get them out. And so we've now put them into a situation where they they are literally homeless. Um, and because units weren't turning over, we had an eviction moratorium. When units did turn over, landlords were not um, as willing to work with individuals who didn't have em employment or didn't have um, steady income coming in. And so that made it difficult to find um, landlords that would be willing to work with us. Um, and so that made it really difficult as well. Um, so we saw survivors who decided to go back to their abusive relationships because um, the options were, you know, stay in emergency housing, um, which in itself feels like a continuous crisis for them, um, or go back to what they knew and um, provide some stability, especially when there were children involved. Um, flexible funding has been really just um, a saving grace for so many survivors. Um, it's really empowering to be able to say to a survivor, you tell me what you need, and um, here's the money for that. Um, I've heard many examples that have been given, but we, we've we been able um, to purchase some vehicles for individuals so they could um, get their children to and from school, um, seek employment, um, and just be able to safely travel to and from their homes. Um, some have, have sought other forms of transportation. People have asked for bicycles. Um, knowing that they can't access uh, public transportation and a car wasn't attainable for them. Um, you know, can I have a bicycle so I can get to and from my job? Absolutely. Um, washers and dryers are a huge thing. I've heard that brought up several times. Just being able to, to have access to clean clothing and um, clean clothing for their children to go to school, um, that's been really helpful. Um, but it's, it's amazing to have access to flexible funding to say, you tell us what you need. You need to set up your entire household um, now that you have a unit, um, you know, getting them beds, letting them pick out um, bedding for their children and, and really just taking that next step and that next turn in their life. It's, it's so empowering and amazing to see. And it's also really empowering for them to feel like they're finally in control of something in their lives that nobody's questioning them about what are they doing with it? Why are they doing uh, what they're doing with that money? Thank you. I think um, what you're saying about transportation is so important when we're talking about rural communities. I think that it's something that isn't often thought about. Um, I used to work in an urban community and it, it was like, well, we'll just let everybody take the bus and it'll be fine. Now that I spend a lot of time in central Pennsylvania, I really understand how that's not possible. And so being able to um, make sure that survivors have just what they need to get from their home to work is essential. Um, but what I really hear you talking about mailing is the dignity that flexible funding creates. And it allows survivors to live in the way that everyone deserves to live, but that we have systematically kept them from being allowed to do. So thank you so much for your work and thank you for um, speaking to that really essential point. Absolutely, thank you. 
And now we're going to move um, on to Vashtai. Uh, Vashtai is um, the director of uh, Lutheran Settlement House and a member program of PCADV and the board president of PCADV. So Vashtai, we're so happy you're here with us today. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about the same sort of things that Mei Ling was speaking to um, at the local program level, but specifically, um, you know, some of the, the, the barriers to providing um, housing in urban areas um, as a Philadelphia program. And um, Lutheran Settlement House does an incredible job of serving culturally specific communities also. So some of the barriers there, um, how that has intersected with COVID-19 and how flex funding helps provide relief. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, we have seen um, during COVID, especially, we have seen a lot of our survivors who have struggled, you know, who were planning to relocate and move and then COVID happened and they quickly had to change their plans and stay where they are. Flexible funding has allowed us to be able to meet the, meet the survivor where they are. And so, you know, if that means that, you know, uh, they can't leave that home, but the abusive partner has been evicted from their property or arrested or any of those things, and they can be safe where they are. Flexible Flexible funding has allowed us to be able to keep them where they are in their homes, um, to support them with changing the lease to only be in their name, helping them get caught up on back rent or paying some rent in advance that'll ease to ease the landlord's mind to be able to let them stay there. In Philadelphia, it's really hard to find affordable housing. They are building everywhere. If you come visit Philadelphia and you drive down the street, you can't drive two blocks without seeing construction happening on new buildings and new apartments going up. But those are very high priced condominiums. Flexible um, or affordable housing is not a goal right now in Philadelphia for, for developers. Everybody is after the big bucks. So, you know, being able to listen to a survivor and to say, like, I can't afford to go anywhere else has been um, really meaningful for us in trying to advocate to be able to keep that survivor where they are. The other thing that we learned is, you know, with our limited relocation funds that we get through our state coalition, which is a great resource to have, it's often not enough because there's a $1,500 limit on what we can um, do with that money. So having flexible money and not having a limit has played a big part in people who can afford to move somewhere else. On average, it takes about $3,800 to get a person moved into a new place with paying a security deposit and a first month's rent. And so being able to not have a limit on there and pay what people need to be able to transition has been off has been awesome. The other thing that we're really concerned about is sustainability after a survivor moves into a new unit, right? So we get them to this new place, they're safe, but then how do they sustain, right? Because most times there's enough money coming in just to meet exactly what we need. So if something goes wrong with the car or, you know, um, something in the house breaks that I'm responsible for. My kid gets a toy stuck in a toilet and the landlord is saying you have to pay this plumbing bill. I don't have money to do all of those things. And so flexible spending has allowed us to really create individual safety plans for our survivors to be able to live and sustain, right? Because we've learned from survivors that it's important to them to be able to have healthy living environments for their children, but more importantly for their children to be able to eat and be happy where they are. And so, you know, we had one, one, one family, um, one survivor who was saying, I'm gonna go back. And we were, our advocate was working with her. And after some processing, she found out the kids were being teased in school because they didn't have school uniforms. We had relocated this family. They went to a new school. The school didn't have, the kids didn't have uniforms. And every day that the kids show up without a uniform, the school was, first of all, finding them a dollar for not having a uniform on. And then they were also separated into a detention class because they didn't have a uniform. And so after speaking with that mom and learning that that was the issue, we were able to provide that mom 
with gift cards so she could go and purchase uniforms for her kids. Might not be a big deal for a lot of us who take for granted that we could do that, but for someone who has had to leave everything and change everything um, in their life, being able to see your kids smile and not feel bullied or pointed out and be different at school is a huge thing for a survivor. You know, other ways that we've been able to use flexible spending is, you know, a lot of times when survivors come to us, um, they are leaving everything. They don't, they have one set of clothes. They have um, just whatever they had on their person when they fled the dangerous situation. So being able to replace those necessary items, medicine, teeth, um, eyeglasses, um, special needs uh, equipment for kids with disability issues and things like that have been great. Um, we've also learned with the flexible spending that empowerment goes a long way, goes further when a person can make their own decisions, right? And so with a lot of the programs that um, provide funding for housing there are so many rules to this program you know it almost feels like you put that some take that survivor out of one controlling situation and put them in another one in a different context right because everything that they're asking for you have to say the program doesn't allow that the funding doesn't allow that but with flexible spending you know we can really embrace the whole empowerment aspect of the work that we do as DV advocates because it puts the power in the survivor's hands to be able to say, this is what we have. What do you want to do with this? What works for you? You know, what would make this better for your family and make your situation, you know, um, livable and make you feel free as a person to be able to start this next chapter in your life. And, you know, I think the one thing that I would want people to know is it's so important to believe survivors, right? When they say to you that something is not going to work, it's not going to work. When they say to you that this is what I need, trust that they know what they need because before they came out to us for services, right? They had taken care of themselves all of this time. With our culturally specific programs that we work with, you know, we've seen um, an increase in the number of undocumented folks that are being referred to us for housing services. And so for flexible, um, with the flexible dollars for housing services, for our culturally specific folks, it's been amazing to be able to be able to help folks that don't have any type of income coming in or are working for places and being paid under the table and being treated really bad um, and the pay is not enough to be able to even pay a month's rent. Um, it's also been great to be able to support culturally specific partners and clients and saying that I can't afford to live on my own, but I can rent a room in my cousin's house and could I use that money to pay rent there um, and, and all of those things. We've also been able to um, help culturally specific um, partners with assisting clients with buying culturally specific foods, right? Because who are we to tell people what they should and should not be eating? Um, a lot of the food pantries that people go to, they don't have culturally specific foods for people. And for some of those things, they are cause health problems for people. Also just being able to provide, you know, a gift card to a culturally specific food market where people can go and buy the food that they wanna eat and what they wanna feed their children has been very welcoming for people. Um, to be able to, to, to do. The other thing that we've heard a lot from with our um, culturally specific partners is the need for help with immigration issues. So, you know, um, with VOCA funding, we were able to hire an immigration specialists who can work with these families and be able to get, even if, you know, mom or dad is not um, documented if the kids are the kids are eligible for SNAP benefits and all of those other things. And so being able to um, have this advocate that can work with our culturally specific clients to be able to figure out what their specific needs are and then find a connection to be able to get them connected to the resources that are available for their specific needs. And then a flexible uh, funding has been able to help us re help us uh, pay for recovered documents, passports and other things that are lost when a person has fled from an abusive relationship. Um, so the need for having unrestricted, flexible dollars is incredibly life-changing for survivors of domestic violence, uh, full circle. Thank you so much, Vashti. I, um, 
so appreciate what you're saying about um, survivors don't necessarily need to leave their home if it's safe. And, you know, so much of uh, the work of domestic violence organizations is often focused because funding requires it on making a survivor homeless to then rehouse them. When truly, if we can ask survivors what they need, just like you all do at Lutheran Settlement House to make sure that if the, where they live can be retained, um, that things can go so much more uh, smoothly for them and really in the long run make a huge difference in their lives. So thank you so much and thank you for the excellent work you all are doing. I'd like to turn it over now to LaVon. Um, LaVon, thank you for joining us today. I really um, appreciate your expertise on the panel. Um, LaVon, can you share with us your experience as an advocate for survivor housing in marginalized communities? And can you talk a little bit about um, the impact of flexible funding uh, in your work? Okay, hi everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Good to see uh, so many people that I've worked with in the field over Wow, many, many years. Uh, and a special shout out to Vesta. I haven't seen her in a minute, but um, always loved the work they were doing. Uh, so yes, uh, thank you, Marie. I will um, try to sum it up uh, in a nutshell as quickly as possible. I am, as Brittany introduced, I am the newly staff person of NRC, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence as the uh, Director of Community Engagement. And I am really excited about that position because it fits my personality so well. And, and it fits the work I've done um, over all these 25 plus years um, in the field in dealing with you know, the advocacy or lack of advocacy, lack of resources uh, for folk. And uh, being one or being a person who is a survivor, uh, being a black woman on top of that and dealing with so many barriers, including racism, um, being homeless, uh, being shot four times, um, almost killed, and my children witnessing that event, and my husband then commit suicide, and the community blaming me, and you know, just dealing with all those pieces. And as many people have spoke about, the lack of flex funding and the lack of housing. So if my, what I always think about in this space um, over all these years, if what happened to me 25 years ago we find survivors are still struggling with the same resources that we have not been able to meet. Uh, we have not been able to meet survivors where they are. That is not to take away any of the hard work we all have been advocating for. It's just to say that change is so, so slow and it's at the expense of people's lives because behind all the dollars, behind all the numbers, those are people's lives behind all of that. And people are really trying to figure it out and, and having little to no resources available to them or limited, right, resources. And, and then I think I remember here in Vesta, I say uh, it, it cost about $3,800 to move a, a person. And then, and then we have only $1,500, you know, to work with when we know the need is great. I always, I've been talking about this hamster wheel around our advocacy and the way we do our work that we just constantly move and move and move and move and move in a circle of motion, but not really getting what we need and never having the ability to jump off the hamster wheel and pivot you know, to something different. Um, and, and how we've been asking funders you know, for what we need in the housing space, uh, but they keep giving us pots, a lot of pots, really nice pots, upgraded pots, all kinds of different color pots, and they they great, they do, they, they, they cook, but we need apples, you know, we need apples, and, and what I compared that to was that the pots is the voucher system, and that's not to say to throw out the voucher system, there, I'm not going to say there's nothing wrong with the voucher system, because that would not be true, but <laughs> the voucher system plays a part, it has its space, but the apples represents inventory, right, and so what good is a voucher? What good is putting $5 billion into a voucher system that is so broken and, and everybody waving their voucher, right? And they're happy they have a voucher, but they cannot find any inventory, whether you rural, whether you urban, whether you the country, wherever in these United States, people cannot find affordable 
housing, affordable, decent housing that everyone is entitled you know, to have, as Brittany shared about, you know, knowing I have great running water or that I just have water, <laughs> right? That I have a roof over my head that, I, head, that I have safety, that I have access to transportation and, and, and to get my kids out of a crime written community, right? And so one of the, the ways in which I hope to bring a change and influence the way we do our work from our funders to looking into our private donors is to really look at one of the models through Habitat for Humanities. I'm a strong believer in not working in silos. I do not and cannot work in a silo because as a survivor who came through this space and then learned about the work on a political and policy level and legislation and all that, all that stuff that connects um, how domestic violence plays out and the resources we receive, I am one to uh, uh, network with all types of groups and folk to get what I know the people on the ground need. My focus, regardless that I work for a national organization, my focus and vision has always been how to get people on the ground what they need from the top down or from the bottom up. I wish we could work from the bottom up. <laughs> that would make things much easier because at the top down, people at the top are so far removed from what's happening on the ground. And if I can be that gap between the people on the ground and the people at the top to bring the lived experiences of what is really happening and what that really feels like, and, and people here have done a great job to describe that, the emotional and mental impact that that has on a person's body of, of what they carry and then we have to ask them to keep doing and to keep being patient and to keep telling them to keep going. That is so, so difficult uh, to ask a person to do that and hold all the other things that are not available to them. So uh, I really hope in my advocacy and in my influence in this space is to help uh, bridge those gaps and to create a model uh, to where we can get those apples of inventory in markets, in communities, particularly black and brown communities, because we are so much more impacted. Black and brown communities are so impacted and so at the margins um, of this space and of this work when you have over 60% of black and brown folk who are homeless, whether they are SA, DV, or just homeless. Um, but we do know in that homeless space, right, that a large percentage of our homeless population have experienced domestic violence and or sexual assault. And then we create unintentionally, we, we create an unsafety uh, space for them when they, when they have to go through that voucher system because of the, some of the demands, sexual demands that landlords ask for through, their, through um, survivors, right? And many of them acquiesce because at the end of the day, they, they, they need a place to stay. They need a place, you know, for for their children. And then when we look at the how racism, you know, plays into that into that piece, it 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 just really exacerbates the type of tools that they use, which blew my mind to determine who's more homeless than the next person. <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing, but that's but that that's what we have put in place. Uh, we created a tool to determine who's more homeless than the next person. Homelessness is homelessness. Uh, whether you live in a shelter for 90 days, <laughs> whether you're in a hotel or whether you're sleeping in your car, homelessness is homelessness. And I, I just um, was at, at hoard to find out that these are some of the uh, ways in which we deal with clients and deal with, with survivors and, and the lack of dignity that we, we offer them or don't offer them, right? And showing up in this way and then we get upset that they upset with us. So we take, we take their pain personal against us. Whereas <laughs> I'm gonna go home every day to a house or to a, a apartment or wherever I'm going to and where they have nowhere to go. And so I really work to help in my advocacy, particularly around the homeless uh, population that this is not personal for on our end, it's not personal at all. However, they show up in their attitudes they they have the right to have an attitude. <laughs> they they have every right to have an attitude. I know I had an attitude every day, uh, when when 
uh, I was living in shelter and they were directing me to uh, houses or, or places to live with big holes in the middle of the floor and everybody acting like they don't see the big hole in the middle of the floor and, and begin to tell me, well, that's the living room, this is the bathroom, but do you see the big hole in the floor? Because <laughs> I know I see it. So, so nobody's going to address the big hole in the floor. So you're going to act like this is decent enough for me to live. So even though you didn't call me a name, right? Even though you didn't take away any control, but the lack of dignity that you showed me in taking me to that type of apartment lets me know just how much you don't value me and just how much you don't see me. And so that, that plays a huge part to the point where you just figure, I'll, I'll figure it out on my own. <laughs> thank you, but no thank you. I will figure it out on my, on my own. And we wonder why only 25% of our shelters are being utilized um, by survivors and particularly even less than that by black and brown people because when we show up, we can't show up in our authentic selves because we're called bad victims or we are made to believe what we see is not really what we see or that we're made to believe that whatever the organizations have to offer, offer us, we have to take it without right. question. And that should not be because how can we work from an empowered, if you say you want me to be empowered, if I use my voice to uh, speak my truth and then it, it goes against what you all can offer, it then becomes a power struggle of me not being in compliance <laughs> because I speak out against what you are offering opposed to us working to offer clients what they need, what they tell us they need. So we know, I know housing has been a need for always in this space, in this movement. And um, one of the things I also hope to change and advocate for, I would really, really love to see coalitions and more DV and SA programs working in that homeless space, in that housing space to work to bring development and inventory into their communities. Because we housing and childcare has always been those number one and number two issues. And the fact that we have not begun to solve that problem, that's a problem for me. And uh, being an entrepreneur all these years, 25 years, oh my God. And then to come into an organization as a staff, who that is, <laughs> that is something getting used to. That's but a lot. I, I realize. What you say, Marie? <laughs> that's a lot. That's a big shift. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole that's a whole mindset in and of itself right. to be like, oh, I'm on the clock. <laughs> I can't go take a, I can't go take a nap right now. <laughs> so, so you know, just deal with that mindset. So that's that's my stuff. But I'm safe, right? I'm not in crisis. I just gotta. It'll take some time and I'll, I'll get there waking up at nine o'clock in the morning opposed to 12. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, to say that we, we have got to um, be open, we have to be open to the many options of what housing can look like. And housing is just not shelters. They are not, I'm not saying to get rid of the shelter either, but the shelters are the pots, are part of the pots. Shelters does not guarantee housing. Shelters does not guarantee permanency because we know shelters are only temporary. So why people get upset, well, I know why they get upset, but why people get upset when we, when we come to say congregate living or communal living is not the end all be all and never should have been, but that's where we stopped, right? And so right. I'm hoping when I came in from being an entrepreneur, I felt like at this point in my life, I could do more on the inside than I can on the outside, giving all of what I've learned, giving all of what I've been through, all the lived experiences I have, and given the climate, right, of, of people wanting to do some things differently works because as an entrepreneur, you have to always be innovative. Your bottom line is always what is working. And if that product indoor service is not working, you have to pivot to something else. And so I'm hoping in this nonprofit space, <laughs> be it on the inside, I can help us pivot uh, with more uh, acceptance and, and, and be okay. Even if we don't know fully what, what it's gonna look like, it's gonna be okay. Cause we got many survivors who don't know what it's gonna look like, but we ask them to trust us, right? Absolutely. And so I'm asking the people on this, call, I'm asking the movement to trust that it is okay 
to pivot. It is okay to be open to change because we change every day. I remember after being shot four times. So like, I still have a bullet in my head, right? And I still have a bullet in my foot, but I can't sit in that space of the four bullets, right? I couldn't sit in the space that my children witnessed their dad shooting me, right? I, I, I had to, I didn't have time to mourn the loss of my husband, the man who I love and the man that tried to kill me at the same time. I didn't have a chance to mourn that my children were so young and oh my God, what is gonna to happen to them? I didn't have a chance to mourn. I, I had to get to work. I had to figure out how these children who were going to be adult people at some point in life, how I was gonna start right now to put some things in place to ensure that they would be productive and that they would not use the circumstances to be a crutch, to be a, a, a crutch in the sense of why they can't be productive, right? I could not allow them to use what happened, that trauma, as traumatic as it was, and still is in some areas, I could not allow them to use that as a reason for why they could not be all of what I knew they could be. And so I had to find resources, even those that wasn't available, I had to create some. And so I'm saying, I know we can do this as a whole. If I did it as one person, I know as a whole, we can change the homeless space. We can, we can change how survivors are shown dignity. We could change how we do this work as a movement, right? Or right. as a field, we could change that together. And, and be open and trusting that it can happen. So that's a lot of my vision of where I see my advocacy in this homeless space and um, you know, bring that really pushing in these next few years to bring that inventory of development into the market. Thank you so much, Levon. And we are here for your vision. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the way that you have expressed how individuals can be involved in this, because we as a movement did not change and we needed to, and now we have to, there's no choice. And this is such an incredible time for individual donors to be able to come yes. to this movement and be with us in that change. Because you've heard from everyone on this panel today what a difference $100 can make, what a difference $50 can make that isn't tied to all of these restrictions that don't actually allow survivors to have the dignity that everyone deserves. So Levon, we're here for you, thank you. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, my CEO, Susan Higginbotham, to wrap us up for today. Oh, you're muted, Susan, I'm sorry. So sorry. Um, thank you so much, Maria. And my sincere thanks to everybody who tuned in today for Ask an Advocate. And for this important discussion about collective action and individual giving that supports flexible housing uh, solutions for survivors and keeping survivors safe and securely housed. I'd really like to lift up something that Brittany said earlier because it was both simple um, and profound. And that is housing is foundational to everything for survivors. Um, I'm so grateful to our esteemed panelists who joined us today, our colleagues doing incredible work at um, other coalitions, resource centers, and domestic violence programs. Thank you everyone for this incredible program. Everyone knows someone impacted by domestic violence and everyone can have an impact this Giving Tuesday. Giving is not just making a donation, it's about making a difference and creating the kind of communities in which we all want to live and the vision of putting an end to all forms of intimate partner violence, other kinds of violence and all forms of oppression. So please get involved today and give for DV to support domestic violence survivors and healthy communities. We can stand together, we can give together, and we can make a difference together. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>